Good morning, and allow me to add my welcome to this uh, RIC, uh, our quick RIC, as the chairman called it. I am Michael Weber, and I'm NRC's Director of Nuclear Regulatory Research. I often joke with Bill that I'm the other NRR. Uh, for our next presentation, it's my honor to introduce Commissioner Jeff Barron, who began his service on the Commission on October 14, 2014. We welcome him to his third Regulatory Information Conference. Before serving on the Commission, he worked as a staff member for the U.S. House of Representatives for over 11 years, most recently as the Staff Director for the Energy and Environment Committee. Uh, for Democratic staff of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And during his tenure with that committee, he focused on a variety of different topics, including oversight of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as one of his primary responsibilities. Originally from the Chicago area, Commissioner Barron earned his bachelor's degree and master's degree in political science from Ohio University. And he holds a law degree from the Harvard Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Commissioner Jeff Barron. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to try to lower this uh, enough so that it's not blocking my face. Um, well, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, this uh, is, uh, as Mike mentioned, my third RIC. And, uh, and so I've done a couple of these speeches before, and I've been trying to come up with something new, uh, different for this morning, and, and Christine knows this. It just gets a little bit harder every year, um, each time. And so I started thinking about some of the advice I got uh, for my first Rick speech. And some people at that time recommended going big picture, philosophical. And uh, so I thought about that for a while, and then asked myself, uh, why stop? at philosophical. Uh, maybe I should be thinking bigger, more dramatic, more exciting. Uh, I thought maybe I could include some poetry or movie quotes um, uh, or a dramatic reading of a risk-informed technical specification. Whoa. <laughs> um, uh, perhaps a bit of interpretive dance. Uh, my daughter Mia does gymnastics and uh, she has a nice arabesque pose. I thought I could try throwing one of those in. Um, you know, is that something you guys would want to see a little, you know, kind of the, uh, <laughs> no. Okay, well, that's, that's fair. And, and, you know, to be honest, um, it just isn't me. Uh, so I decided uh, to stick with uh, the nerdy nuclear jokes. There's a tradition of that. Um, and I think they've been reasonably successful in the past, and, and they don't require me to be particularly limber. Um, of course, with, uh, with Project AIM, our budget is not what it used to be. Uh, so we contract out our joke making. Um, Christine uses comment cards from prior years. Uh, uh, my preferred joke supplier has been Darius Dixon from Politico, um, who once again came through with a joke uh, for me this year. And this is, I think, for the first time, this is actually a Darius Dixon original. He wrote this joke. Um, and so if you guys are ready for this, we'll give it a shot. Um, here it goes. Uh, th this joke harkens back to an early NRC effort to get Werner Heisenberg to speak at an event. And the conversation went something like this. Uh, hey, boss, I'm, I'm sorry. We couldn't book Heisenberg. Oh, what happened? I don't know. We put a lot of time and energy into it, but couldn't track him down. Well, you know, that may have been your problem. <laughs> you think? Maybe you liked it. Maybe you didn't. Uh, either way, I'm pretty sure that, that went better than the interpretive dance would have gone. So um, uh, our best available option, I think. Um, you may have noticed that um, I have a new uh, a speaking slot this year. I guess in some ways we all have new slots because we pushed it back a day. But um, during the last two years, uh, I opened up uh, day two of the RIC, which I had to myself uh, in a kind of Siberian exile kind of a way. Um, <laughs> this, year's, this year's a little different. Uh, now I'm like the, uh, the palate cleanser between uh, our new chairman and our prior chairman. Uh, seriously, though, it's, it's an honor to share the morning with Christine and Steve. Uh, I spent some time perusing the deep recesses of NRC's website, which has a page listing all of the former commissioners and their terms of service. 
And that page confirmed what I had already suspected, which is that Christine has more experience as a commissioner than any of her predecessors as chairman. So she brings a tremendous amount of knowledge to the position. Congratulations again, Christine, on uh, your new role. And with 30 plus years of service at the agency, I'm confident that Steve has more overall NRC experience than anyone who has served on the commission during the last four decades. Thank you, Steve, for your hard work as chairman and for your continued service on the commission. Uh, and I want you to know that I would say that even if we did not depend on your continued service on the commission for quorum. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been getting a, asked a lot lately about what the change of administration means for NRC. It's a question I think that matters for our staff, our stakeholders, and our international counterparts. So I thought I would take some time this morning to share my thoughts about what may change and what will stay the same. I've already discussed one obvious change, which is that we have a new chairman. But there's also continuity in the membership of the commission. Christine, Steve, and I have all served together on the commission for more than two years. The three of us work very well together. We don't always agree on policy, but we always have constructive collegial discussions and debate. And I think that's how a commission's supposed to work bring together people with different backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences, and have them grapple with the tough questions together. We learn from each other, we question each other, we help one another to see issues in a new light, and ultimately we make sure that important regulatory decisions are carefully and thoughtfully considered. I think it's a very effective decision-making structure. And that is something that does not change with administrations. For more than 40 years, through eight administrations, both Democratic and Republican, collegial decision-making and independence have been at the core of NRC. Our independence ensures that regulatory decisions are made based on science and technical expertise, and that our focus is on the agency's public health and safety mission. That's not going to change. Independence is a cornerstone of NRC's regulatory and oversight activities. And the administration has made clear that the recent executive orders relating to regulatory decision making do not apply to independent agencies like NRC. Our commitment to increasing the agency's efficiency and agility while remaining focused on our health and safety mission is also unchanged. I've been very impressed by the willingness of the NRC staff to take a hard questioning look at what work the agency is doing and how we're doing that work. Last year as part of Project AIM, the NRC staff generated a list of 151 proposals to reduce costs. The Commission approved nearly all of those proposals. Some of the resulting savings have already been realized. Other cost-cutting measures are set to kick in during fiscal years 2018 and 2019. Declining workloads in particular areas, such as new reactor licensing, are generating additional savings. And the agency has essentially been under its own self-imposed hiring freeze for the last two years. The impacts of these Project AIM efforts have been dramatic. Our budget has gone down, our fees are going down, and the number of full-time NRC employees has dropped by more than 11% in just two years. We now have fewer FTEs than we did back in 2007 when the agency was in the midst of ramping up for the expected wave of new reactor applications. With these reductions, I believe we are close to achieving one of Project AIM's central goals, which is to align the agency's resources with our current and expected workload. There may be some further FTE reductions in corporate support or as a result of more efficient processes in other areas, but I think there's a strong case to be made that the agency will soon be correctly sized for our workload. Project AIM has been valuable, but these steep reductions have created some significant challenges. To successfully meet our licensing and oversight responsibilities, NRC needs an engaged workforce with the right skills and strong morale. For that to happen, and for the agency's long-term health, we need a stable pipeline of new talent. In order to align our resources with our workload, it made sense to set tight limits on external hiring. But that approach cannot be maintained indefinitely. In the medium term, we're going to need to bring new resident inspectors and health physicists and probabilistic risk experts into the agency. A significant number of our employees are retirement eligible or will be soon, and that requires NRC to attract talented individuals to maintain the strong technical competence that has been a hallmark of NRC. We also need to keep the talent we already have during this period of change. Each week, uh, my fellow commissioners and I get a list of new NRC employees 
who are arriving at the agency and current employees who are leaving the agency for one reason or another. And those lists are very lopsided. There are virtually no new arrivals. A significant number of employees are retiring after many years of federal service. But some very talented individuals are leaving to pursue opportunities elsewhere. Some are heading to the Department of Energy or the National Labs. Others are going to the private sector. I wish them all the best, but I want to make sure that NRC can retain our next generation of leaders who may be concerned that they won't have the advancement prospects at NRC that they likely would have had a few years ago. That's a challenge for us in training, career development, mentoring, workforce planning, and succession planning. With more people leaving the agency, we also need to make sure that we're capturing all of that knowledge. Every organization has to manage these challenges, but it's harder during a period of downsizing. With a reduced budget and workforce, one of our key priorities must be to ensure that core technical capabilities are maintained in the staff. This isn't an issue that just affects NRC. It also affects licensees, applicants, and other stakeholders. For example, we're seeing growing interest in advanced technology fuel and risk-informed licensing submittals. In order to conduct effective and efficient reviews, we need to make sure that our staff retains the technical and regulatory expertise to handle complex and evolving areas of work like these. There's broad agreement that it's important for NRC to align its resources with its workload. I think that's a reasonable goal that we all share. But it does raise a question about how we make sure that we can handle new, unexpected work. Part of the answer is improved agility, the ability of, to redirect NRC staff with the needed skills to the new work. We talk about that piece a lot. We don't talk it as much about the need to maintain a surge capacity for when significant unexpected work comes along, such as the potential construction of the Bellefonte reactors. So what does all this mean for the future of Project AIM? In terms of our budget and FTEs, the reductions, have already been set, the reductions that have already been set in motion by the Commission will continue the sharp downward trend of the past couple of years. But ongoing reductions of that magnitude year after year are not realistic. Deeper and deeper cuts would prevent NRC from accomplishing its vital mission. In my view, our resource and FTE levels need to flatten out pretty soon. On the other hand, the project aim mindset of striving for improved efficiency and agility is absolutely sustainable. We can and should internalize this as an enduring focus of our work. I spent a fair bit of time so far talking about the organization and management of NRC. Let me turn to some of the safety and security issues we're working on. This month marks six years since the nuclear accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan. NRC remains focused on post-Fukushima safety enhancements and lessons learned. The Commission is currently considering the draft final rule on mitigating beyond design basis events. That rule addresses a number of the recommendations of the near-term task force and is the culmination of years of work. Meanwhile, the staff's focus, as Vic mentioned, is shifting more and more to oversight and inspection of licensee implementation of several safety enhancements and natural hazard evaluations. Recently, the NRC staff also provided the Commission with its proposed resolution of the three remaining Tier 2 and Tier 3 issues. I want to take a minute to highlight one of the staff's initiatives, the establishment of a more routine, proactive, and systematic program for identifying and evaluating new information related to natural hazards. Under this approach, the staff would collect aggregate, review, and assess new scientific information about a range of natural hazards on an ongoing basis. The staff would begin by compiling and organizing a knowledge base for each type of natural hazard consisting of all the information gathered through the agency's previous work. This would ensure that the data, models, documentation, and staff insights relied on in the past are readily retrievable in the future. Over time, the staff will expand this knowledge base through active and ongoing technical engagement with other federal agencies, academia, industry, international counterparts, professional societies, and consensus standards organizations. When the staff obtains new information about a natural hazard, the staff will assess its potential significance in the context of the accumulated hazard information rather than in isolation. 
The overall objective is to determine if the new information could have a potentially significant effect on plant safety. I think the staff's plan to actively and routinely seek out the latest scientific information about the natural hazards facing nuclear power plants will significantly enhance safety. And it is necessary in light of the impacts of climate change on some hazards, such as flooding and drought, which are expected to exceed historical levels in the future. Our regulatory processes need to account for the changing frequency, intensity, and duration of these events. Successful implementation of the proposed process will require a sustained long-term effort by the NRC staff, but deepening and refining our understanding of natural hazards will provide substantial benefits in the year to come, in the years to come, rather. Power plant decommissioning is another major area of focus for the agency. In the last few years, six U.S. reactors have permanently shut down, and seven more have announced plans to close in the coming years. Despite the growing number of affected units, NRC does not currently have regulations specifically tailored for the transition from operations to decommissioning. As a result, licensees with reactors transitioning to decommissioning routinely seek exemptions from many of the regulations applicable to operating reactors. I see two main purposes for the decommissioning rulemaking effort that is now underway, and both are vital. First, the rulemaking will allow us to move away from regulating by exemption in this area. The exemption approach is not very efficient and does not provide for public participation. And second, the rulemaking provides a chance for NRC and all of our stakeholders to take a fresh look at our decommissioning process and requirements. There is a lot of interest in this aspect of the rulemaking. States, local governments, nonprofit groups, and the communities around these plants are very engaged and want to share their views. In response to NRC's advance notice of proposed rulemaking, the agency received 162 comments, including comments on every regulatory area covered in the notice. And there were a lot of regulatory areas covered in the notice. Uh, many of the comments were focused on the level of public involvement in the decommissioning process. Other hot topics in the comments were the 60-year time limit for decommissioning, whether NRC should approve post-shutdown decommissioning activities reports, emergency preparedness, and the use of decommissioning trust funds. The staff considered these comments and released a draft regulatory basis last Friday. A 90-day public comment period officially opens today. I look forward to reviewing the staff's work and the comments we receive on it. I feel strongly that we need to thoughtfully consider the ideas presented by stakeholders with an open mind. I'm keeping a close eye on the schedule for this rulemaking. The timing of this rule is crucial because of the plants that will be shutting down in the coming years. We need to complete this rulemaking in 2019 because all parties will benefit from having the rule in place for those plants who have announced shutdowns. This poses a management challenge for the agency because many of the technical experts working on the rulemaking will also need to review the anticipated exemption requests for the plants that are closing. We need to make sure that we handle this licensing workload while keeping the rulemaking on track. Additional plants transitioning to decommissioning only increases the value of completing the comprehensive rulemaking in a timely way. Another constant for NRC and our licensees is the need for robust physical and cyber security. The potential threats facing power plants, fuel cycle facilities, and radioactive materials licensees are constantly evolving. They require NRC to maintain effective physical security requirements, including the force-on-force -force inspections conducted by NRC. Performance-based cybersecurity standards are also essential and are being implemented. Although distinct from physical security, source accountability and tracking play an important role in ensuring that radioactive sources do not fall into the wrong hands. For category one and two sources, NRC and the agreement states have web-based systems to inventory sources, validate materials licenses, verify that possession limits are not exceeded, and prevent unauthorized parties from obtaining radioactive materials. However, Category 3 sources are not included in the National Source Tracking System, and there is currently no regulatory requirement for a vendor to verify the authenticity of a license for Category 3 sources before selling them. 
The Government Accountability Office highlighted this regulatory gap last year when it found that a fictitious company established by GAO could produce counterfeit Category 3 possession licenses and obtain commitments from vendors to sell it a sufficient amount of material to reach Category 2 levels. In response to GAO's audit, the Commission supported my proposal to direct the NRC staff to examine the options for closing this gap. One option is to include Category 3 sources in the National Source Tracking System, but there may be other approaches that would resolve the issue. I have an open mind about what the right answer is. We should look at the pros and cons of the potential solutions and then decide what makes sense. Let me turn to a few areas of our work that could be impacted by the priorities of the new administration. NRC is already preparing for advanced reactor licensing and advanced technology fuel qualification. But the level of Department of Energy support for the development of these technologies may affect the volume and timing of our future workload. Currently, we're seeing a lot of interest in advanced reactors from vendors, utilities, and policymakers. One vendor has begun pre-application discussions with the staff, and we anticipate three more vendors may reach that point next year. In response to this interest, NRC is ramping up its activities on advanced reactors. We want to make sure that we have an efficient and effective licensing process for non-light water reactors. At the end of last year, the staff released its vision and strategy for achieving this goal. Vic uh, discussed this a little bit. The staff is also seeking public comment on draft implementation plans for the near term, mid term, and long term. Draft guidance for developing principal design criteria for advanced reactors just went out for public comment last month. For fiscal year 2017, NRC requested funding for advanced reactors off the fee base. In my view, that's the fairest way to fund our expanding activities in this area. We are also seeing an acceleration of efforts to develop reactor fuels that can better withstand higher accident temperatures and provide longer coping periods during station blackout conditions. Fuel vendors and utilities are now aiming to deploy lead test assemblies for more evolutionary technologies in the next couple years. And some stakeholders are contemplating potential changes to NRC's regulatory process for qualifying and licensing new fuels. Given all this activity, I think holding a public commission meeting on this topic with a broad range of stakeholders later this year would be valuable. It would be a good opportunity to discuss the technologies, where they are in development, anticipated timelines for licensing submissions, resource implications for the agency, and any proposals for adjusting the existing regulatory process. I often get asked uh, what's going to happen on high-level waste. In fact, that question may already be floating around in a comment card or two. Uh, well, NRC's role is to review license applications, and our process is premised on having engaged applicants. The administration and Congress set the overall policy direction on high-level waste and make decisions about funding. The NRC staff recently docketed the Waste Control Specialist license application for a consolidated interim storage facility in Texas. The staff has begun its safety and environmental reviews, which will pr proceed concurrently. NRC anticipates that another license application for a consolidated interim storage facility in New Mexico may also be filed. Although there is still a lot of uncertainty about fiscal, 2017, fiscal year 2017 appropriations, NRC would likely have sufficient resources to review both applications. I discussed several regulatory issues this morning. Each and every one of them requires NRC to remain focused on enhancing our openness and transparency. When we communicate clearly, hear from a diverse mix of stakeholders, and thoughtfully consider their ideas and comments, we make better decisions. I'll close with one more thing that won't change, and that's my interest in visiting plants and other licensed facilities. I've had the chance to visit a number of sites during the past year, and those visits are always, uh, always uh, valuable because I get to see facilities and equipment firsthand, check in with NRC's resident inspectors, and talk with licensees about their concerns and areas of focus. So I want to thank those of you who have hosted me at your sites. I look forward to reconnecting with folks this week and getting out to additional sites during the coming year. With that, uh, I'm happy to answer a few questions. I think we probably have about 10 minutes or so. Yes, sir. Great. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. Appreciate your speech. We have a bumper crop of questions here, and uh, I don't know that we'll have time to answer them all, but uh, we'll give it a shot and see how far we go. 
Uh, Commissioner, there's been a tremendous investment on security measures, especially after the 9-11 attacks on the United States. Yet security inspections and force-on-force -force exercises continue, uh, or at least are perceived to continue to expand uh, the design basis without an explicit change in the design basis threat. Why is there no credit given for operator action, local law enforcement availability, and flex strategies in NRC's regulation of security? Okay, well, thanks for that question. I, I, um, I haven't seen um, cases, or I'm not convinced that we have a, a large scale issue with, um, with force on force going beyond the design basis threat. Um, but I do think that we've seen um, over time with force on force act, uh, inspections and, and exercises going on across the country, um, sites keep a very close eye on that and, uh, and make adjustments when they see um, uh, tactics. Uh, strategies, approaches at different sites that um, may raise uh, issues for them. So I think that's, I think that piece of it's natural. That's not, uh, that's not something that NRC is imposing on anyone. It is, our requirements are there. Uh, and uh, if licensees choose to take additional steps to uh, increase their own confidence that they will uh, succeed in a force on force, um, I think, I think that's for them to, to think through. Uh, and make decisions on. Uh, I know that um, our security office is taking a look at some of the specific um, elements of that question in terms of credit for um, local law enforcement response and, and potential crediting of flex equipment. So um, we're going to wait and see what the staff comes up with on that and then consider it uh, when, once they've had a, a chance to take a look at it. Um, I, I would just reflect that um, you know, at the RIC, one of the things that the Commission spends so much of its time on individual commissioners is our bilaterals with other countries. And, um, and my observation is that um, many of our international counterparts have been moving in our direction on physical security. Um, so I think, um, you know, given the, the dangers uh, of the world in which we live, I think that that's probably a trend that will likely continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another question. The commenter noted a recent NRC acceptance letter for a license application uh, for an amendment, and it said uh, in this acceptance letter that the estimate of the staff hours to review that application is about 715 hours. The commenter notes that at about $265 per hour, that translates to roughly $200,000. And uh, the commenter observes that that seems extremely expensive for the amendment request. Uh, so the essence of the comment is, does the value of NRC's uh, licensing review of an amendment request justify that uh, size of expense? That's, that's kind of a tough question, given that I have no idea what the license amendment request is. Um, I, I can uh, give that to I'm gonna you. Go with, I'm going to go with yes. I'm going to go with yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think I think we're you know a bargain at twice the price. No, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. Um, no, I, I I'm just kidding. And I, it's uh, there's been a lot of focus um, in recent years and recent times, particularly with Project Aim, in thinking through, as I mentioned, what is the work we're doing? How are we doing that work? How can we be more efficient in doing that work? We're seeing uh, a lot of efficiencies. Uh, as I mentioned and, and, and Vic mentioned and the chairman talked about um, in terms of, uh, it's really reflected in the size of our budget, um, it, the decline in the budget, um, the decline in our workforce. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing that carrying through in, in a decline in fees. And so um, we're very thoughtful about that. There's uh, have also been a, a lot of efforts and it, again, it gets difficult um, without knowing specifics. I don't think I want to get into specifics of individual um, submittals anyway, but there have been a lot of efforts in terms of streamlining our processes, um, being more thoughtful up front about what, what kind of time is going to go into uh, the review of a specific submittal um, and thinking uh, and, and having good discussions with the, with the applicant or the licensee about that and, and keeping them apprised of where things stand. So it's a, it's a continued focus um, for the agency. Um, but, you know, being, you know, in all seriousness, 
these reviews are important, um, and and this and we want to make sure that we're efficient, but we also want to make sure that the staff is is doing an adequate review, um, and um, and really fully considering the issues raised in any particular submittal. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. okay, well, we've got, a, we've got a little bit more information about that particular one. Uh, based on your observations, Commissioner, do you believe there's a safety culture concern at the NRC? Safety culture concern. Well, I, I think um, I've been here now about two and a half years, and I, I am very impressed, continue to be very impressed with the focus of our staff and our managers on the safety um, and health mission of the agency. I will say this, in, in last year's um, review of, you know, the Inspector General has a, uh, a review uh, periodically of, of safety culture issues. And in one area there that I think we talked about a little bit last year that did concern me uh, and that I know there's a lot of management focus on is a willingness to use the processes we have at this agency for expressing um, differing views. Uh, whether it be the non-concurrence process or differing professional opinion process. Um, those are really important processes. And I know I personally have benefited from reading, reviewing, thinking through a number of the non-concurrences and DPOs that have um, been submitted um, over the years as we've, uh, as the Commission has considered some of the tough um, policy issues before us. So those are incredibly valuable, those processes and the products that, um, that result from them. So I'll take this opportunity um, uh, to say once again, please, uh, if you have, if you're, an, if you're an employee at NRC and you have a concern about something that's going on, speak up, utilize those processes. Um, we want to hear from you. We benefit from hearing from you. Um, and uh, that is just so important for us at the agency to have that uh, safety culture and that culture of openness um, and willingness to express views that um, you know may be in the minority, uh, and that's fine. We want to hear those views. If, you're, if there are safety concerns, please uh, please mention them. Okay, and uh, your last question. Okay. Uh, you and Chairman Savinicki and Edio McCree all talked about staffing in your prepared remarks. The question is, how does the new scale application affect staffing plans and goes on to note that if the new scale application is not accepted for a licensing review, uh, likely other passive and advanced designs may not also move forward, which could mean a death knell for new reactors and future applications. Wow, that is a gloomy question. Um, well, yeah, let, me just, let me just say, um, I think uh, it's probably pretty likely this week that um, a determination uh, will be announced uh, one way or the other on, on whether the staff is docketing the new scale application. Um, so folks can, can wait and um, see uh, what happens there. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as has been mentioned, we are very much focused both on that application but also um, on the other new reactor and new reactor design applications that we have and ones that are anticipated um, for the coming years. And, and that'll be a continued area of focus for the Commission. Thank you very much, Thank Commissioner. You.